Airships did valuable service for the Navy, gathering information and reporting back to the fleet. But they were large, slow, and vulnerable. By the end of hostilities, they looked obsolete as a weapon of war. After the war, Germany was prevented from building airships for her own use. The Zeppelin company maintained its expertise by building one for the United States Navy. Once they were freed from restrictions, the company embarked on a massive new civil airship. It was named after Count Ferdinand, the Graf Zeppelin. It was the biggest airship in the world. The Germans took great pride in their achievement and quickly established a world lead in passenger airship travel. Regular services were flown across the Atlantic to New York or to South America in only two or three days. Eventually, the Graf Zeppelin circled the Earth. Each flight was a luxurious adventure. There was a little sort of steps and they ushered you up, and you realized that you were not in the Zeppelin, you were in this gondola which hung down below. And it looked tiny until you got in it. And then you realized it was 55 meters long. And then as they let us go, you gradually felt a sort of lift, as if you were in a small boat and you come to the crest of a wave, you know, you feel yourself going up to the top and then gradually going down. And we didn't go down, we just went on going up. <laughs> the ground disappears beneath. There's no noise, no vibration. Everything is as quiet as a mouse. The ground just vanishes away. Then, when we reach a certain altitude, I'm signaled from the control gondola. There's a ringing bell, an urgent sound, and a moving indicator. Engines full ahead, 1,420 revolutions. And so the engines are started and run up to the proper speed. Oh, they hummed so beautifully, so smoothly, they could send you straight to sleep. Very smooth, very quiet, very hushed, and superbly efficient. I mean, real German efficiency at its best. The other people you saw were the officers who came and talked to you politely, but the, the real people running the Zeppelin, the rest of the passengers didn't see them. Every morning there were freshly baked rolls. Lunch, five o'clock tea, with freshly baked cakes, of course. The cooks, in my opinion, were, I believe, the busiest of the crew. Sometimes they were poorly appreciated, I think. You always get some passengers who complain all the time. And they would come one after the other to breakfast, and many liked to stay sitting there, occasionally standing up going to the window and looking out. There was always something to see from the ship, even over the sea, because we flew so low. Normally, we were between only 250 to 500 meters. There was certainly no boredom. Some passengers would write reports on typewriters. Others read a book. What we offered on board was very similar in many ways to that which was offered on board an ocean liner.
I have a certificate presented to me by Aeolus rather than Neptune, proving that I have crossed the equator in a Zeppelin. There was a tall officer coming along and he clicked his heels and said, you are the first English woman to cross the South Atlantic in a Graf Zeppelin. And I congratulate you and would you care to see around the Zeppelin? <laughs> would I care? <laughs> There was a catwalk which went from nose to tail and looming over everything, the gas. It was squishy when you touched it. I didn't like it at all. <laughs> and there was a doorway. Well, there was a man sitting there, apparently two hours at a time. They sat there watching the engine. And there was no handrail, there was no nothing. There was just you and the Atlantic. As the engine gondola was a few meters out from the main hull of the airship, there was a connecting ladder. When we wanted to go down into it, a sort of door or flap could be opened and you climbed down the ladder. The first time it took a bit of courage, but we got used to it. When we saw a whale being attacked, by sharks, and we were low enough to see the blood. I mean, that was wildly exciting. You felt you could lean out and touch the mountains. It was absolutely superb. This was just gliding like a sort of, I don't know, a dream more than anything else. In Britain, Two giant sheds at Cardington in Bedfordshire still mark the site of the Imperial Airship Scheme. Sixty years ago, the British government saw airships as a means of linking the empire by air. Two were ordered, the R100 and the R101. The R101 was comparable in size to the Graf Zeppelin but Britain lacked the expertise in building and operating airships which had been learned in Germany. It was overweight, it leaked, and it was pressed into service before being properly tested. So we came out of the hangar at, at five o'clock, about five o'clock in the morning. It was quite dark, dark in the semi-darkness, and the ship was walked out of the shed and then was transferred to the mooring mast, which was about a mile across the aerodrome. Everybody naturally thought that this was the beginning of a new era for long-distance passenger flights, deluxe travel, but in much quicker time than a normal ship at sea would do it. Lord Thompson of Cardington, the Secretary of State for Air, was impatient to fly to India. There were protests that more trials were needed, but Lord Thompson insisted that he leave on schedule. There were 54 passengers and crew on board. As far as the crew were concerned, nobody was unhappy about leaving. Nobody was worried about it. R101 was loaded with provisions for the flight, including champagne, and by one estimate, a ton of luggage for Lord Thompson. In the early evening, he climbed aboard for what was the airship's first flight of any distance. Quite a crowd had gathered to see her depart. 